key miss would be if we didn't do this ourselves. So just based on that, like we started doing this and we spent a lot of time like um, talking to stakeholders, people, um, you know, we were trying to serve, which was mainly educators, young parents and young children. And through that, we, we identified this um, huge gap in the market that we were very passionate about. And that gap was basically, um, you know, making a difference to education. So, so we did secure some seed funding from the university and we even filed a provisional patent for uh, this, this, this thing that you're seeing on the screen. Um, but we found our passion in education through this project and we decided to pursue that instead. And that's how we actually started. So we're running like a lot, we started running a lot of these courses that that taught like, you know, software, that taught like, you know, coding, that taught like how to tinkering and then hardware skills and 3D printing and all these different different kind of things that we thought that, you know, we wished that we had learned earlier. So we started running these programs uh, all over Singapore and outside of Singapore also. So these are, you know, snapshots of, uh, programs that we've run in the past. And as you can see, the kids here are pretty young. So um, we've worked with like kids as young as like four all the way to like, you know, I guess 64. So like, I, I think age is really just a number when it comes to these things. So um, basically through all this, we we found another innovation opportunity because we were interfacing so, many, so much with kids. Um, we realized that there's this huge gap in in computer science education because so because of uh, uh, a, a number of factors so first because teachers parents teachers and parents need assistance in teaching this which is why like people like us get hired right to to run these programs um kids have too much screen time and there's a there's a struggle inherent struggle with trying to learn computer science because it just it, there's a stigma that like learning computer science is very difficult but um the logic of computer science is rudimentary it can be picked up by you know a seven-year-old but um usually people have to struggle with the syntax which is the grammar of computer science to really enjoy the logic and um we were thinking of how we can flip that entire concept on its head and make it fun and interactive so just with that you know um objective we set out to we set out to really just you know realize that and we didn't really know how we were going to do it but i mean what resulted was potato pirates and uh, what you're seeing on your screen like on the on the left it's like a left and right analysis or example of um you know how you would see these same concepts in code and how they appear in potato pirates right so what we essentially did was we stripped it all down to its bare bare bones and bare basics and we removed syntax and just focus on the logic and you know just just by doing that just by flipping that um we realized that we had we actually started accelerating you know the learning curve of computer science for first time players right with, with for people with no background in computer science so um potato pirates you know has gone on to see a lot of good reviews so like what you're seeing on the screen is media features and awards that we have been you know very humbly presented and a lot of these most in fact all of these have um, been completely unsolicited like we had to find out from other people that we had been featured on these publications and magazines um yeah so potato pipe has been touted as one of the best ways to teach computer science so best stem toys for kids and things like that um and i guess the reason is because it actually works what you're seeing here are learning outcomes in just one hour, right? So what we have done is uh, with over 2000 people, we've done pre and post assessment. When um, we we ask them like basic fundamental questions of computer science before running, uh, uh, you know, a one hour or 90 minute workshop with them and then after. And what we see is like nine in 10 people grasp, you know, fundamentals of computer science that in a CS 101 would take you at least 10 hours to accomplish. And um, that's, I mean, that that to me is pretty cool. So it's not just like we are trying to be hipster, but I think it's it's also working and it's, um, you know, there's, there's data to support that. So I guess that's what supports the media features that I just showed you. So four years, four years, you know, forward, like fast forward to now, which is like four years after our first release in 2017. So now we have uh, two games, you know, out there in the market and another in the pipeline, uh, which also will be our first app. So 
Um, collectively, Potato Pirates has um, raised over 500,000 or half a million on Kickstarter. And essentially, that's uh, how we have sustained our business. And that's pretty much been our bread and butter, um, you know, for the, for the majority of what we've been doing. And we, we, we have been organically transitioning from, you know, a training slash service company to a tech slash product company. And uh, that's organically been happening, but that's definitely been accelerated by, um, you know, the pandemic in the last year. So what we're now trying to do is we're trying to introduce a lot more depth, replayability. So now we're thinking way beyond Kickstarter, right? Because like when we first started, it was all about, okay, we, we want to launch a successful campaign. And we did that, but we didn't really think beyond that. So now what we're trying to do is essentially like cover an entire um, syllabus, like the entire O-level syllabus, um, you know, with, with just the game and providing it, providing a means for uh, assessment, right? Um, because a lot of schools were world over use potato pies in their classrooms, so we're trying to serve them better. Um, so now, I guess, is the time where I transition and talk about uh, our other love. So, like I said, um, when I started this, uh, the main the main motivation was really to make a difference in uh, computer science and um, and design thinking, which which are our two loves, and we're trying to create learning and engagement tools that support this in the 21st century. So two, since for the past two years, we've been really building our biggest innovation yet, which is called Rolljack. And Rolljack is really a gamified classroom engagement tool that is pretty much a Swiss Army knife for engagement, uh, classroom engagement, which is suitable for you know brainstorming, quizzes, project work, uh, you name it, right? And um, we are focusing a lot more on peer-to-peer -peer learning through collaboration, peer assessment, and smart learning, um, smart teaching assistance. So you know, you know, using the power of like AI and things like that to introduce that, and introduce a lot more of team-based learning. So again, this uh, this this was really based on our own uh, our own innovation uh, opportunity assessment. So we we identified this as a gap that we could fill because uh, classroom engagement is difficult, especially done online. And of course, there's tools like Kahoot, but Kahoot only serves um, quizzes right it's closed-ended engagement and uh unfortunately that just doesn't cut it anymore right so we need a lot more than that um moreover like uh, for for corporations it's very difficult to to um inefficient rather to to do collaboration across departments and bodies and ultimately it's really about building um building the the confidence and skill sets of the individual and um what's happening out there is that schools are valuing academic more academics more than creativity and it's not their fault i mean that's what schools are meant to do right but what's happening out there in the world in in the job world is you know analytical thinking innovation and creativity these are the most important skills of the future so what's happening is there's a disjoint between what's happening in schools what's, what's being taught in schools and what uh, and what's um, you know required out there in the market so uh, that that was pretty much the genesis of how this came about, right? When we when we sort of identified that there's this gap in the market, and you know teachers are struggling to connect innovation slash design thinking to mainstream academics. Um, the middle screenshot here is uh, basically um, this is at the end of the SATD movie hackathon, I believe in December twenty. Uh, 2018, yeah, and we ran this for over 300 plus people, and that's and I like to credit that as like the starting point of you know what this is of what uh, Rojak has become because that's when we started um, you know seeing this uh, seeing this innovation opportunity emerge, and the the image on the right is uh, I mean you can spot me over there. This is um, one of, one of the workshops that we've done with uh, Capital Offshore Marine. So me and the other two co-founders with me, we all hold adjunct teaching positions at SUTD. So uh, because of that, we run a lot of um, we run a lot of corporate training programs, or at least we used to before COVID. Um, you know, corporate training programs in design thinking, data data analytics, and app development and stuff like that. So through all these experiences, we identified these things. And how we started was really trying to do um, this thing called Shindogu. So uh, Chindogo is this Japanese art of useless innovation where you just combine two random objects and create a mashup, right? And you just you just design something that that is brainless, but some but some of it is actually pretty cool. 
So like the selfie stick was actually invented in 1983 um, to this whole uh, form of Sundogu um, by an employee of the company Minolta, which, uh, which went on to become Konaka Minolta. And uh, yeah, that never actually saw any use until like smartphones became a thing. So um, yeah, that's some trivia for you right there. But um, but well, why why we always used to do this is because this really this really set the tone for the entire workshop where people could you know just um, just chill out and have fun, right? And people don't have fun at that, right? So we really believe in the the element of play. So you know then we started thinking about how can we do this online? How can we? It's very messy to like do this with three hundred people because we actually did this activity with three hundred people when we ran the hackathon, um, the SVP movie hackathon in 2018. And then we're like, we should try and do this online. And we realized that there's very few tools that assist, um, you know, creative exercises or design thinking exercises online. So um, then we built, uh, we basically started prototyping, we built a prototype and um, we started testing it. And we, we um, if we go clockwise, so on the top left hand, uh, that's like 400 people as part of like a um, believe like an innovation symposium in 2019 uh, held by this is held in like CHIJ St. Nicholas, but like it was three different schools that were involved there. And uh, what you're seeing on the screen, um, you know, at the stage is the early world look like. So we held a uh, massive ideation session with all these people. Um, on your top right, that is like uh, that is a workshop that was done for prospective. Um, new admission students into SCT in 2019 or so. Uh, and there's like a 100 of them who are ideating together. So <clears throat> in the bottom right, you can see like these little cards. So um, while we were still prototyping, we hadn't digitized everything, right? So in the spirit of iteration and prototyping, we still had like physical components and, you know, made together with our app. Where now we have digitized like pretty much everything. Um, it wasn't really like this when we started. Mm -hmm. And like we started doing this in you know corporate workshops as well so you can see me over there in a bunch of different corporate workshops trying to test this out with different stakeholders and rollback has now gone gone on to you know to basically be power packed with a lot of these design thinking slash innovation skill sets and mindsets um and yeah i mean we're pretty proud of uh, how far we've come so we are going into an open beta this month after two long years of like being in a feedback loop we've been in like a closed beta for like the past six months and um now like what we have we, like makes rollcheck um you know a really good tool for subject-based challenge-based inquiry-based project-based learning like all these different learning um modalities and we're pro trying to provide like a meaningful education or audience engagement experiences um, where everyone, you know, can have equal and um, an equal part and equal participation and equal opportunity to collaborate, um, for peers to be empowered to evaluate each other's, you know, work and collaborate with them online. So uh, that's a very that's a very interesting or uh, uh, if I may like unique, um, you know, feature of what we're trying to do because there's a lack of, uh, you know, these these kind of uh, peer to peer engagement in other like online engagement tools right so just a feature comparison to like tools that people on this call you know may have been may, may have used before or maybe are familiar with so uh, as you can see we focus a lot on um open-ended engagement um tools uh, open-ended engagement um uh, or open-ended uh, formats right and and uh, introducing a lot more peer-to-peer -peer engagement so uh, Pretty much like what we do, and I just wanted to like sort of set the stage for you know what you know what Kodomo is all about. Yeah, thank you so much for your explanation about what Kodomo is about. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, after hearing your after hearing what you say, I want to buy potato pirates and try <laughs> to learn coding. I'm I'm disappointed you don't have it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think just now in your presentation, you also mentioned that um, you managed to like raise some funds on Kickstarter. Yeah, so I was just wondering, like, why do you choose Kickstarter as your crowdfunding platform? That's a great question, actually. So uh, there are a bunch of reasons. So when we were starting out, um, and we had no inclination of like what we were trying to achieve, we just knew the, the you know the big objective 
you know, the, the big audacious goal was to just make computer science more uh, accessible, right? And provide a means for people to be able to engage with it, right? Um, and then what we ended up was with the card game. And then we started looking into like, you know, are there coding card games out there? So first, you know, um, I and partly on like, I guess all of the co-founders, we, we do like the game. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up like also like playing a lot of tabletop games, but I never really thought I would end up making one. Um, so we started looking at other similar products and we, we had seen one called Robot Turtles. And Robot Turtles was like the first of its kind, which was a game that taught computer science to kids, right? And um, that was, yeah, so that was uh, funded uh, on Kickstarter like in 2012. So it was a very old, um, you know, campaign. And then, and even at that time, even like almost ten years ago, it was it raised over half a million. I think it raised over six hundred thousand US dollars. And um, and and we were looking at this like huge boom in the gaming industry uh, on on crowdfunding platforms. So um, so gaming, like especially tabletop gaming, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, funding um, verticals in in crowdfunding on Kickstarter. And it's the highest growing. So, like, like the the cumulative um, annual growth rate of uh, crowdfunding games is just exploding, right? The crazy amount of games. And just based on that, we were like, yeah, that's cool. And and moreover, um, the whole the whole point of Kickstarter is to alleviate your risk as as a as a creator and as an inventor because it allows you to flip that entire concept of taking a product to market. Uh, where you actually raise funds for it before you even create it, right? So you present an idea, and people who resonate with your idea will fund you, right? To realize that idea, and over five thousand people funded that idea of potato pirates, and uh, we were very humbled by that. Um, you know, and that's that's how we got funded. But that's really the mindset we went into this with, like, because we're like, you know what? Um, you know, us really believing in user-centered design, we were like, this is the best trial by fire validation. Like, let's see if people actually will trade money for this, you know? And uh, they did. So um, that's really why we went down the Kickstarter route. Firstly, I mean, just to recap, it was really just a good time, a good market. Like, it was the right product, right? So it was the right product to be on that platform. Um, like, if it was, you know, an, an app, uh, a, like just a, a mobile app, I, I wouldn't think that, you know, that would may, may be the right funding decision um, and then also really because we wanted validation by people right we wanted to see up front and if we knew it was going to fail we wanted to know before we put like more time effort and resources into it mm, i see okay yeah so um to launch on kickstarter um i understand that you actually need to begin by setting your goals and then a time period to complete it so how do you decide like how much time and money you need to raise to kickstart your startup. Yeah, so uh, about that. Um, you see, uh, there, there is like the right answer and then there's the risky answer, right? The right answer is that you should always raise, um, you know, a sum of money that you know that if, if you just even get that and not even a cent more, you'll be okay with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't ask for too little or too much because um let's say you ask only for like five thousand dollars to to start a you know a new product but you know inside that you need at least 25 or fifty thousand to even to even conceive this thing and you don't want to end up in a state where you know you just get like five dollars funding but you know it's not enough so at the same time you don't want to set your goal you know at like two or three hundred thousand because um uh not not because not because i don't think it can be done but i just think that you lose momentum right so like the the playbook of kickstarter states that you know projects that get funded quickly like within let's say 24 to 48 hours right they ride on that momentum and you know they play with the they, i guess they do well on the kickstarter algorithm so they get recommended to more people right and that way that that sort of keeps your momentum going as like snowball effect Right. So um, I, I guess that's that's one one way we decided how much we wanted to do. So we sort of find the even ground. I wouldn't say that we 
we priced our raise at like 15, we priced our raise at $15,000. Um, uh, we, pri yeah, so, so the 15,000 that we had was not, uh, I would say, I, I would say if I had only gotten $15,000, I would be pretty scared because I don't think we could execute what we were trying to do with just that amount of funding. Right. But, uh, at the same time, um, we, we wanted to, like I said, ride on the momentum. So we found like an even ground and we also look and we look at data, right? So we're very data driven and we always look at what other people have done and try and study that and, and sort of employ, you know, what can be used for us, you know, in the best way. So that's pretty much, you know, how we decided how much that's going to be funding your second, your second question about how long it should be funded. Well, actually, if on, on Kickstarter, there's like there's so much data to support. What's the best amount of time, you know, you should be raising money? What's the best time to launch? <laughs> you know, uh, the best time to launch, if anyone wants to know, is like midweek, so like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, sometime in the evening of our time, so that is the morning in the U.S. Because uh, even our market, like for potato pies, like 40 to 50 percent of it is in North America. So like we have to think global from day one and we are a global from day one company. So, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much how we decided. And like the, the sweet spot for, for funding is somewhere between, you know, uh, 25 to 32 or 30, you know, lesser than 35 days. So that's sort of how we decided how much we want to, how long we wanted to, you know, be on Kickstarter. Hmm, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I also understand that, uh, Kodomo managed to get funded in less than 10 hours yeah so yeah, i just know like how do you manage to do that <laughs> what an impressive feat yeah yeah um well the short answer is that virality is always generated you know in most cases you have to definitely do legwork to um to really push the you know to get the initial push of that virality marketing right um and how we did that is um is, is is basically content marketing, lead generation, um, inbound marketing, like whatever you want to call it. But uh, I guess the name of the game is to build an audience before you even launch. Mm. The way we did that was we 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 had the personality or the personal persona or the profile of the potential uh, backers of Potato Pirates on Kickstarter, and those were young parents, educators, and gamers, right? So um we decided to try and um yeah do a lead generation campaign um to to sort of like get these potential um customers as, as part of our as part of our outreach so uh how we did that was we we created like downloadable resources right and we created downloadable resources um that, that are still actually on today uh even today available on our website so if you go to potato pipes game and you look at our resources section, we have a lot of downloadable resources that we still use for leading uh, for, for lead generation campaigns. And what that means is you, know, you want to find, you want to create content that is so good that people will want to exchange their personal information to, in order to be able to access that content. And by personal information, I mean email, right? Because that's the most valuable thing because that's how you reach them, you know, when you're going to launch, you're like, hey, we're live, you know, come check it out. So, um, and the way we profile them allowed us to decide what is the right content to create. So we created offline learning resources for computer science. So if uh, if, uh, if an educator or uh, a, a young parent is interested to run an offline activity to teach their kids the fundamentals of computer science, they could download, you know, our resources, which was like slide decks and worksheets and whatnot, off of our website, um, just by exchanging their emails. And why we decided to do this content is because if someone is interested enough in that content that we have, you know, um, interested enough to exchange their emails for it, they are definitely going to potentially be interested in, you know, potato pie, the product, because that's how we, we profile them. So we create, we create content that is relevant to the profile of our customer. And then uh, just based on that, we, you know, we ran these lead generation campaigns. So we ran ads, we ran ads um, and we go on forums, we engage with people. So we have to keep testing different channels and really see what brings more people in. So that's how we did it. 
And like we launched in September of 2017. By April of 2017, the product was ready, right? Everything was ready. And we just spent the next four months, we didn't spend the entire summer doing lead generation. So by the time we launched, we had a, we had a mailing list of over 3,000 people strong. And that's what I would recommend. I would recommend uh, anyone who wants to launch something, you know, especially on Kickstarter. Yeah, go for 3,000. I think that's a very good number. So uh, try and build your audience to over 3,000 people because not all 3,000 of them are actually going to back your project, right? So the conversion rate from lead to actual paying customers, you know, uh, even if you get like a 20% conversion, that's amazing, right? That, that, that doesn't happen for everyone, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's a great strategy to employ. Mm, I see. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, then, um, because I understand for Kickstarter that at the end, uh, once each donor has backed your product, once it's done, you need to send like a small gift or like a personal experience for them. Yeah, so how do you ensure that you're able to do so? No clue, actually, to be honest. So, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, you, you're right. So it's like a, in, on Kickstarter, you get a reward, right? Like, you're you're getting a reward for backing the product, but essentially to cut it to you know to cut to the chase, it's like a pre-order. People are pre-ordering your product, right? And if they pre-order your product, they expect your product, right? So, and they expect your product on schedule, right? Because you would promise like to them. So when we when we did this uh, in September, we said that we would be able to ship it out to them by February of the next year, right? Uh, or March, I'm forgetting now, but um that was the timeline that we promised them that we would be able to manufacture and then ship it out to them um i guess uh, as as a you know as an entrepreneur you need to really be good at solving your own problems so uh, none of us you know had ever been you know uh, you know uh, we have no clue about all these things right so uh until until we were done with the campaign, I actually never paid any attention to the manufacturing part. I never knew anything about the manufacturing because to me, the most important thing was to push the funding, right? It was, uh, that was the most important thing when we were live at that time. So once that was done and that's it, then I, you know, we, we sort of switched gears and switched focus and started looking at, okay, we raised a good, a good amount of money. What do we do now? <laughs> well, where do we go from here? So then we started looking at all these manufacturers and just two weeks after our uh, campaign ended, me and my co-founder, Kashen, we flew out to Germany to the biggest um, tabletop gaming convention in the world, right? And it's called Spiel. And it takes place on the third weekend of every October. And uh, it's a four day convention. And imagine like all six, um, you know, expo halls just filled with tabletop games or maybe even bigger because they have eight expo halls. So they have eight expo halls just filled to the brim with board games. So it's, it's, it's like Valhalla for, you know, anyone who's uh, interested in tabletop gaming. So we went there and that was the first time I actually started talking to manufacturers, right? Because we met a bunch of manufacturers. We set up some meetings um, beforehand and uh, I started talking to people. And in fact, um, I, got recommended, I got recommendations from manufacturers because everyone who's there is like sort of, you know, in the business. So um, we came back to Singapore, and my co-founder Tat Leung got married uh, two weeks later, and uh, on the 11th of November, on the 12th, again for so myself and my co my other co-founder Tiash, and we flew out to China, and um, we went from factory to factory to factory to factory to factory. We visited so many manufacturers, right? And um, we visited, I would say, easily like five, six, seven manufacturers, right? And by by the end of it, we were we had we were down to like you know we had narrowed it down to like two manufacturers, and uh, and and you know now we we haven't looked back since. So we 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 worked with manufacturer A, uh, who 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 promised us the sun and the moon, but like didn't quite deliver on it. Um, and we now only work with manufacturer B, and they have always you know they have never failed us. So now, like after going through all these experiences, um, I have actually consulted with four or five different tabletop gaming projects on Kickstarter, you know, given them manufacturer recommendations, like marketing marketing partner recommendations and all those things. So now, like we, we had a very steep learning curve because like we didn't really have anyone to learn from, but there's a good amount of resource online. 
Um, but then again, like I said, you really need to know how to solve your own problems. Um, so card games or a tabletop game is not the most typical thing to manufacture because it's mostly like paper, <laughs> paper and plastic and wood. So uh, it's not like uh, it's, it's not like high precision engineering. It's not like many moving parts and stuff like that. So like hardware projects are exponentially more difficult, but uh, that's why a lot of hardware projects also fail. No one kicks out and things like that. Um, so I guess the long story short is that we work really hard to you know find the right the right manufacturing partner. And once the manufacturing was done, then the next step was distribution, and even that was another uphill struggle because we had to check all our options and see which one was going to work best. And um, yeah, my other co-founders, uh, they flew out to Shenzhen to visit their warehouse. And uh, yeah, and and so then we worked with that global distribution partner. And, you know, lucky for us, everything worked out really well. Um, now we have three global distribution and fulfillment centers, two in North America and one in one in China. So now we've sort of learned the ropes and like, I guess we are much better at this whole thing. Um, but yeah, shipping and, and fulfillment is the most difficult part of any, you know, Kickstarter campaign, more, more so than the manufacturing, really. And it, it, because it's the most expensive part of, uh, you know, your cost of, your cost of goods, right? Um, where Kickstarter is your revenue and, and then you have to really make sure that your revenue stays more than the cost of manufacturing and shipping all these things out. And if you make wrong decisions or uncalculated decisions, um, you run out of money. And that that, that happens um, quite frequently on Kickstarter. And in fact, I'm a super backer on Kickstarter. You get the super backer status after you've backed more than 25 projects. Um, I've backed well over 25 projects. And I still have, I still have uh, you know, unfulfilled campaigns from 2017, 2016, 2018, you know, a lot of them don't manage to pull it off because, you know, they just run out of cash, you know? So um, I guess when the Kickstarter community knows that there's an inherent um, sort of risk to backing any project because it doesn't guarantee you'll ever receive your product. Um, but you as a creator have the, you know, uh, I guess you have the moral responsibility of ensuring that you can deliver that and establish yourself as a reliable creator. I see. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, so you, do you manage to ship out your products on time or like, was it also delayed? So for our first game, I think we were like one month late, oh. which I think is very excusable. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Um, I think we have like a fulfillment rate of like 96, 97% for our first campaign. Um, the, the, you know, the few percent that are not fulfilled are really because they are un, unreachable, right? So they never respond to us. They, we don't, we don't have their address, right? So when someone backs your, when someone backs your product on Kickstarter, you have no idea what their shipping address is. All that happens after the campaign ends. So some of these people just go missing, right? So uh, these are called stragglers and like we, we basically are stragglers and that's why they're not 100% fulfilled. So for the second campaign, we were more or less on time. Um, it's just that there are many, there are many different uh, regions or countries in the world which don't have the most reliable postal service. <laughs> so so uh, that's uh, something beyond our control. And uh, fortunately, people uh, you know, who are backers from, from those countries know that it's not really our fault. So, uh, I mean, stuff like this happens, but like, uh, we just have to be, you know, we just need to know how to handle these situations. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah, so um, how do you know like whether a business is suitable for crowdfunding or not? Good question. Um, I guess the most, um, maybe I can break it down for you, just based on observation and, and trends and data, right? So based on trends and data, um, some of the biggest uh, or most successful campaigns on Kickstarter uh, revolve around gaming projects, which are either tabletop gaming or um, you know, physical or digital games, like either on Steam or on console or whatever it is. Uh, I, I personally have backed a bunch of those as well. So, uh, mo oh, oh, uh, you know, aside from that or besides that, uh, I think hardware and physical products do really well on Kickstarter as well, right? Uh, product like there's a category called product design, 
um, which is really about like physical products um, that do really well. Oh, look, um, maybe I can show you a physical example of it. So these are two, uh, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't choreograph this, okay? It just happens <laughs> that it's here. So this is a mini computer, it's called the GPD Pocket. And I bought this on Indiegogo. I'm a, buy, I'm a Kickstarter backer of this, right? And uh, this is a massive uh, USB-C hub. It's got like 16 ports. It basically converts USB-C to anything under the sun, right? This is also on from Indiegogo. So Indiegogo uses uh, Indiegogo is a really good platform for um, doing you know things like that. Um, you know today is a, a great day because um, we, we're shifting offices and uh, I basically unpacked a bunch of my things and mm -hmm. turns out most of the things I own are from crowdfunding platforms <laughs> and they're right in front of me so I can show you very easily. Um, this is like a USB-C uh, SSD drive. So the story about this. So this uh, also was on Indiegogo, right? Um, but the, if you you check out the if you check out the campaign called Hyperdisc, okay, Hyperdisc, you can anyone on this call can go and check it out. So if you check out their campaign on Indiegogo, you will see that this thing has been advertised as the size of your credit card. All right, but this is what it looks like, and this is not the size of my credit card, right? So uh, things like that happen. Right, and you need to be ready for it. And like, of course, these people get claimed by the community, but um, you know, at least you receive the product because um, on Indiegogo, uh, there is also or, or on any campaign uh, platform, there's uh, there's this there's this phenomenon of people, you know, coming up with a really nice looking campaign page and really nice looking video, and it looks super cool, but it's a scam. And and I am I am not ashamed to tell you that I have been a victim of it, right? Because I like to back all these all these things, right? Like that looks super cool. Um, but some of them uh, are scams. So I've actually scammed. Uh, I, I've actually backed another like um, sort of like pocket book, you know, uh, something. Oh, this is another GPD pocket book. So I have two basically. <laughs> well, don't ask me why. <laughs> don't ask me why. <laughs> so. Um, uh, which which looks something like that, right? And it was super cheap, and um, that was uh, that was a scam. Like so, they raised over a, over a million dollars in Kickstarter, and like everyone's like just asking where where you know where's my product? Where's my product? It's, it, they're they're gone, right? They're just vanished. And Indiegogo can't really do much about you not receiving your product because that's inherently the risk of crowdfunding platforms. This. <laughs> it is another uh it's called the latte panda wait let me see this is the logo latte panda right and this is basically like a it's like a raspberry pi on steroids right because uh it runs on windows 10 and it has gpio you know output and it's really cool and we're trying to use this to set up like a server in our new office to control led lights and stuff so like we're, we're just trying to hack this so um yeah um yeah initially so i i, I got sidetracked i know you, your question was more about like what kind of products get uh, funded on kickstarter but i guess i showed you a live demo of what kind of products get funded on kickstarter and if i walk over 10 meters over there we have a whole shelf with board games on it and i have backed a lot of board games on kickstarter as well so uh, beyond that, uh, I think what gets funded on Kickstarter are creative projects. By creative projects, I mean like if you want to write a book, uh, you know, and if you want to create a like, so I've seen like children's storybook, you know, things like that get funded on Kickstarter. Um, movies, right? independent productions, independent movies and documentaries. I have personally backed history documentaries because uh, I love uh, if anyone knows the cartoon Ren and Stimpy from the early 90s, it was like a cult classic. And uh, like the last two years or three years ago, there was like a Ren and Stimpy documentary funding. And back that because I wanted to watch a documentary on, on this cult classic cartoon. Um, there are a lot of independently made horror horror films. And, and uh, I'm a fan of horror movies. So I have backed a bunch of those as well. So, um, I mean, honestly, everything under the sun gets uh, back on Kickstarter, but I think the you know the the community is it's so big, and I think over the year it has sort of like identified its strong point, 
So Kickstarter is great for, you know, um, physical games, digital games. Indiegogo is pretty much the place to be if you're a hardware product. Because every, every hardware product I own is from Indiegogo. Every, every like, um, board game or digital game that, I've, that I own is from Kickstarter. It's like, I mean, it just so happens that these, these platforms have sort of built their own niche. But it doesn't mean that if you fall outside of that category, you can't. But um, that's just sort of the way it is. Mm, okay. Oh, okay. That's quite interesting. Yeah, I always. I have more stuff around me, by the way, that I could show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, but I think just now you mentioned that like um you got scammed before, right? So like, how does a company prove that like they're not a scam on crowdfunding platform? Yeah, that's a great question. Very good question. So the due diligence is done by the uh, like by the platform. So Kickstarter and Indiegogo have their own due diligence. So if you are a, like uh, doing a you know if you're a first time creator and you're doing um, like a tabletop project, right, a tabletop game like Potato Pirate, the due diligence is pretty straightforward, right? Like so we got like so we had to submit for approval and we got the approval in the same day, right? But it's just like a more high risk project, like a like a hardware project, like which are the ones that have mainly gotten scammed on, right? Those have a due diligence process of like two to three days at least, or or weeks, right? And and they will they will ask you for proof of which manufacturer you're working with for for the different components, you know, who's assembling what and this and that. So uh, there is a there is definitely more stringent uh, due diligence being done on these platforms, but it's not a hundred percent, unfortunately. Okay, okay. Wow. Okay, so like may I also know like when is the right time for like the company for a company to like start crowdfunding? Um, I mean I can't really tell you when is the right time to do it. Um I guess I guess when you have a solid idea, uh and you have, you know, enough to show that you're you're you, you need to show a vision of what you're trying to achieve. So if you look, if you look, you know, at our campaign videos, um, we did. I mean, although like even uh, in our second campaign video, it's it's really just a bunch of like people having fun and it's super slapstick. But we do show like what we are trying to achieve, and we had we have like production grade prototypes made where you know we showcase that this is what it looks like. We explain the product in detail. We did that for the first product as well. So. <clears throat> I guess there's a certain amount of homework that you have to do before you can, you know, uh, successfully launch a product and know that it's going to do well. But but here's the here's the big caveat that most people think that it's all about your product, but but you really need to spend no more than fifty percent of your effort on your product. You need to spend the other fifty percent of your effort on building an audience, because you are not trying to launch your campaign to fail. Right, you're launching to succeed. Right, you're not you're not hoping to you're not hoping for a failure so that oh I don't need to do any work if I fail. Lucky me. Right, you're not you're not doing that. You're doing this because you're really passionate about it. So you need to spend at least fifty percent of your time and effort on building an audience, or else you're really just not going to have anyone who cares about it because you don't want to launch cold. You want to launch when you're red hot. Right, you don't want no one to know about you. And then you start telling your, you know, friends and family that, hey, I'm live. Uh, please come and back me. So um, that's, you know, that's part and parcel of uh, innovation and product development. Building your audience is your prerogative as much as it is to build your, build, build, uh, you know, build a kick-ass product. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah. Then um, there's also like a growing trend of equity crowdfunding on like other sites in recent years. Yeah, so what are your views on like this sort of equity crowdfunding? Yeah, uh, that's a tricky question. I don't think there is uh that I could tell you like it's good or bad, right? I think it really sometimes it works for people, sometimes it does not. Um I know I know that equity crowdfunding was gaining some traction and then it also slowed down. Um also because I get like um uh, like ICOs became a thing as well, right, with crypto. Um, initial coin offering. So um, I guess uh, I don't really have a direct answer to yes or no whether it, it works or not. But um, I think 
I, I think it has it has definitely definitely like it could it it's good point um and i think it's it's a it's a good risk for uh you know both both uh i guess the person being funded like the creator and the person who's funding them um because i think a lot of people who like you know my friends or like people who I just meet they're like oh so like they yes, a lot of people inherently think that crowdfunding is really about equity right so i'm like no 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 so crowdfunding works in two ways right so i look at it as pre audit right so we're just gathering pre audit right um and that's that's pretty much my main motivation for using crowdfunding platforms but I'm, but i think i think as the crowdfunding ecosystem has developed it's become uh it's become very much like uh, mature right so there's equity based funding um there, there there is also like icos there's also like sort of like this uh, accelerator programs for companies to before they get on crowdfunding um where indiegogo used to work with a bunch of different uh like accelerators to accelerate like hard hardware accelerators because indiegogo is like sort of really big in that space uh so i think it's developed a lot and i guess the way crowd equity crowdfunding works uh, if for anyone who doesn't know is uh so let's say i'm i i i i'm not uh, you know an an institutional investor or neither am i like i'm just like a retail investor right I'm, and i i only invest like in small ticket sizes of a few hundred or, or a few thousand dollars and typically when companies get funded that's in the tens or hundreds of thousands and that's usually only accessible to angel investors who like private investors who invest with those ticket sizes of 50 100 200 300000 or vcs venture capital funds who also invest in those you know ranges so for retail investors for like uh, you know an average joe like you and me uh if we want to own a piece of the pie so we can only do that if the company is publicly traded right but uh the way equity crowdfunding works is that for privately owned companies on a small ticket size you can own a piece of the pie right and that's that's pretty much how it's uh, that pretty much sums up what equity funding is and i think it i think it definitely works um but i also think it's not as clear cut as um, you know just uh, funding a product right because funding a product is like revenue right but whereas if you're doing equity funding it's more like you are raising around so it's more like it's it's uh, paid up your 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 paid up capital is increasing and things like that so it's not it's not exactly the same kind of thing but uh i definitely do think it's it's a, a cool thing but um i've never really done it so uh i can't i can't comment too much on it but at the same time i do know it it's sort of like it 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 picked up a few years ago and i haven't really seen much about it happening in the recent past so i'm not really quite sure and also like black from like kickstarter never went into the space so i, I i'm not sure why So I guess it's you know it, it never quite caught on as much as like regular company. Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah. So um, lastly, like if someone wants to enter the industry that you're in, what are like three pieces of advice that you give them? <laughs> so um, the first is what I've already said, but I'm going to reiterate. The first is virality is generated, right? And you cannot expect. for you to be handed you know attention on the silver platter attention is the most difficult thing to harness or uh, you know of from anyone in this day and age because uh, we have we 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 have a uh, sensory overload you know perpetually right so it's very difficult that's the first piece of advice the second piece of advice is 50% product 50% market right so you have to focus 50% of your attention on uh, on building on on building an awesome product and the other 50% of your attention on finding the right channels to connect this product to the people who would pay, pay money for it right um that's the second piece of advice the third piece of advice is um i guess to sum it up is just about testing 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 right so you when you when you're when you're coming up with something new you're not going to get it right on your first try or maybe even your 10th but uh what the the name of the game is to fail fast and fail early and fail often but fail forward so what that means is you always want to fail 
uh, in the forward direction means like you want to be learning something from that failure. So if something you're doing is not working, you know, that's, that's fine. It's not like you, you know, it's not like you spent a hundred thousand dollars or six years of your life on it. Right. Um, so, uh, if, if you build a quick prototype and you test it with your friends, uh, you know, and you find out that it's not working, it's good it, that at least, you know, it's still bits of information, right? Because when innovation is working towards an unknown solution to an unknown problem, right? Because you think it's a problem, but you don't know whether other people think it's a problem. So as long as you have not validated that other people think it's a problem, it's not a problem, right? But that becomes a problem. <laughs> so, um, so validating whether what you're trying to solve is really something that resonates with other people is your prerogative, and it's your mo most important thing that you need to identify and and um, validate. So, and you can only do that. Uh, you can only build a better product when you keep doing this, right? And you keep doing this over and over again. So you test. So it's a build, test, and uh, iterate, right? It's 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 a feedback loop where you are building and you're um, testing this and you're gathering that feedback and taking that feedback and going back to build something better, right? So um, always remember that that users are at the center of what you're trying to do and you have to validate that. You have to validate that you're actually trying to solve a problem for them because that's the most important thing and that's the number one reason why startups fail. Mm, I see. So how does like a startup um, validate themselves in like a lean way or like the fastest way possible? Yeah, so that's a great question again. Um, so, so startups are all about like having fun, having no rules, breaking things, uh, being unapologetic, right? And I completely agree with you, right? That's definitely the mindset and uh, the environment that a startup needs in order to be able to innovate. But that does not take away the fact that there should be a discipline. And there's this thing called innovation accounting, right? So you need to be able to account for innovation. You need to be able to account for whether what you're doing is moving in the right direction. Because at, every, at any given point, you're like, you have so many different directions to move, right? You could, you could do this, you could do that, you could do this, right? So there's so many things you could do with your product. And, and finding, finding a way to validate whether like moving in the, uh, direction A as compared to B is going to be better for you is the most important thing. And uh, that's what we call innovation accounting. And what that means in like, uh, uh, in, in like more um, solidified terms is it's, uh, it's always data driven, right? And data can be quantitative or qualitative. So like you could, you could achieve this by doing user studies or interviews or whatever not, right? Or you could, uh, you know, you could achieve the same with surveys, or you could achieve this if your product is a digital product, like you could achieve this with like live data. So, um, you know, finding finding the right data that you need to be monitoring to see whether you're moving in the right direction. Um, on that note, uh, there's also a key difference between like useful data and what we call vanity metrics. Um, vanity metrics are metrics that sound cool, but mean nothing, right? So for example, if if someone tells you like, oh yeah, um, we have uh, you know hundred hundred users on our platform, and uh, this month we have hundred, uh, last month we had fifty, so it's a hundred percent growth, right? And like let's say you meet them three months later, then they say, oh we have one thousand users now, so it sounds cool, right? It sounds cool as though like their user base is growing, but that number is naturally going to grow. That number can never decrease. So it's so it doesn't mean so much. What means more is like the month to month growth, right? What was your growth last month compared to the month before? Or what was and or what was or um what percentage of your users are actually active? So great that you have one thousand active users on your platform. Oh sorry, one thousand users on your platform, but how many of them are active, you know, compared to when you had only one hundred? So is that number growing? So those are the kind of, kinds of things that you need to determine in order to realize that you're moving in the right direction. So really, really understanding what to measure, right, is uh, very important. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah. So um, I guess before we move on to the Q and A, like I'll just like to ask, um, what is your favorite book, or like what would you recommend other people to read? Yeah. Actually, I've covered a lot of what uh, my favorite books would cover as well. So I would recommend two, or maybe three. <laughs> the first, um, the first is 
uh, I guess the first is the uh, the lean startup by Eric Rice. Um, yeah, so that that covers a lot about um, innovation and innovation accounting, and and a step up from that is um, lean analytics, right? Which talks about like all the data driven decisions and like vanity metrics and things like that. Uh, these two are really, really. <laughs> these two are really. Thanks, Emil. <laughs> he's, he's saying it's his favorite book too. So these two are really, really great books. Um, and I guess the third book that I would recommend. Um, well, it's it's sort of a tie between two. Well, the first is, or maybe I'll just. Uh, let me see. Um, we we can go with sprint. <laughs> So uh, Sprint is a great book about like how to um, like uh, how to run Sprint, right? Uh, design Sprint, and uh, that's very important when you are that's very important when you are um, you know trying to move in the right direction quickly. When you're trying to move quick and learn whether people are resonating with your with what you're trying to do. So that's um, yeah, that those I guess would be my top three. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely read them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think uh we can move on to the Q and A now. Yeah, so I think um the first question, um I think Kelvin Tan. Yeah, I think he was asking like how much time is expected to run a Kickstarter campaign? Time? I'm sorry, the question is how much time would be required? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, let me just click into the tab to read it myself. Um, well, I don't quite understand what that means. Like, if you're talking about like time in terms of like how much time would be required if you're like for your live campaign, um, that, like I said, the magic number is somewhere between 25 to 35 days, right? And if you're talking about how much time is required to actually get ready for your campaign, <laughs> that can be months and years. Uh, really depending on how fast you are able to be ready for your campaign. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, but that's uh, as far as I can go. Uh, unless uh, you want to come up with a follow up question, I was required personally to commit. Oh, I see to commit to running the campaign. Uh, thanks for clarifying, Kelvin. So, uh, Kelvin, unfortunately, this again is something that uh, really depends on you. But let me tell you my personal experience, right? So. Earlier, I was saying that uh, when we were live on Kickstarter, I never even cared about who we were going to use for manufacturing. Now, why is that? It's because I I just had laser sharp focus on building, you know, um, our audience and really pushing this. How we did that was uh, a few things. So when when you're trying to market things, right? There's uh, there's four four different segments of markets uh, or marketing, digital marketing, I guess. There's paid, earned, shared, and owned, right? So paid marketing is like running ads, right? Earned marketing is like when people write about you, right? Owned marketing and shared marketing is, uh, so owned marketing is like when you are posting your own social media, right? Your own owned marketing or your own blog post and stuff like that. And I guess shared marketing is uh, when people share your posts on theirs and stuff like that. So um, I basically just dedicated myself to doing that. So um, we were on forums, we were on Reddit. So we, we have a lot of like these gray hat, gray hat um, um, like, I guess, marketing strategies where we would go on. So, so the, the cardinal sin of Reddit is to self-promote, right? You cannot self-promote yourself on any subreddit. Um, and lucky for us, like we have a bunch of Reddit accounts that, uh, you know, um, have, have good karma. And we would just use those to uh, engage with the audience on the on the subreddits that were relevant to us, you know, contributing things and blah blah blah, and, and like just engaging with them, um, just so that we had some sort of presence over there. But but at some point, like when the opportunity was right, we would just you know slide in that you know there's this cool thing on Kickstarter right now, and uh, although that was like self promotion, um, we would make it seem as though like it was. I mean, not make it seem, but it was always relevant to what we were discussing, right? So, um, yeah, that helped to move move our dial, really get in, you know, bring in bring in sales as well. Um, I used to write 
endlessly to people on Twitter, to people like via email. Um, if you all know like Jai Kawasaki, uh, yeah, so I've, I've emailed him and he's actually replied to me. Uh, the ex-CEO of Reddit, I, I sent her a copy of Potato Pirates. Um, yeah, I've done a bunch of like really random things, but like uh, I think I guess the name of the game for me when at least we're live is to really do everything it takes to move that number, right? And so we have like our own press kit. So we, we create a press kit and we send it out to journalists after journalists after journalists, right? And we target, a, we target journalists who have written about similar products in the past, right? So um, those those products that uh, are similar to us and, and journalists that wrote, them, wrote about them on places like TechCrunch, or Mashable, things like that. Um, yeah, so those those were the people that we reached out to, and some of them ended up writing out, uh, writing about us. Um, and some of it was earned, like the Wall Street Journal article that we had. It turns out that the lady was our backer on Kickstarter. So uh, she actually mentioned potato pirates on her article, and overnight our sales skyrocketed, and we had no idea. Um, and to a point that someone from like in the Midwest of the U.S., I think it was like the state of Montana or something, uh, emailed us and said, like, saw your article on the Wall Street Journal, the you ship to Montana. And we're like, what, what article on Wall Street Journal? So like, I went to Wall Street Journal to try and find this article, but um, I didn't have a subscription. <laughs> so I couldn't even read our own article because I didn't have a subscription. So I bought a subscription just to just read our article. So uh, to answer your question again, uh, Calvin, is um, really like, it's really up to you, you know. Um, but you, but my 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 rule is to really do what it takes to move the dial. And as long as what you are doing moves the dial, you should do it. Another example I have for you is I wrote to the uh, the moderator of Free Code Camp, right? And um, Free Code Camp at that time was the biggest publication um, that you know wrote about tech related articles and had a readership of three hundred thousand. So I wrote to him on t on Twitter, like I sent him a tweet or I sent him a DM or something, and uh, he actually replied to me saying like, "Yeah, that's that's great. I, I I can't really allow you to promote your own product, but what I can do is you can write an article, and if we like it, we will post it on Free Code Camp." So I wrote an article. I really just spent that whole day writing an article, and I I posted it like I submitted it to him or to their team, and they liked it and they posted it on people camp and uh that brought in like over almost a hundred you know backers which is like i guess over five thousand dollars worth of orders right and um not not just that but like a lot of a lot of more people found out about potato bikes through that article right so that's that's really what it takes and and yeah, my last point on this note is that when you are doing these things naturally there will be more so many more no's than yeses right and if you're gonna take a no as a failure right i'm the biggest failure in the world because the most number of people have told me no but that doesn't mean that you know i'm a failure right because it, it, the campaign is still a success so you have to not take it personally you know don't think that the person at the other end of the world has a personal agenda against you right so some people are just too busy to reply to you. And if someone doesn't reply to you, it doesn't mean it's a no. So be persistent, but just don't be a no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, the other question, which is also from Calvin, is do you recommend like running some simultaneous campaigns on both Kickstarter and Indiegogo? No, I would not recommend that uh, because you're cannibalizing your own, your own campaign. Uh, what usually happens nowadays, Calvin, is um, typically when a, when a campaign is concluded on Kickstarter, you will still need at least six months or so until you can be ready for retail, right? Because it takes you that much time to confirm your manufacturing and do that and blah, 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 right? A limbo of six months. Um, in the, uh, sort of a bridging campaign called Indiegogo In Demand. And so basically, when you conclude your project on Kickstarter, you can move over to Indiegogo in demand, which is usually for successfully funded Kickstarter products who just you know keep their campaign up there. 
for more people to for for basically having a place to accept more orders for people who are late, right? So for people who miss your campaign and want to buy your product, they can get it on in, in Indiegogo in demand. Um, we did that for our first campaign. For our second campaign, we just did it on our own website. Yeah, because um, we didn't really want to pay an extra like transactional fee because uh, Kickstarter takes a five percent cut, and I believe Indiegogo does between four and seven percent somewhere over there. So we didn't want to pay that extra, you know, cut. So we just did it on our own website. So um, you you should not you should not do um, simultaneous campaign. You should only do one at a time. Uh, I think it is like I said, cannibalizing your own campaign. Mm. Okay. Yeah, then the next question is by Emil. So when crowdfunding on Kickstarter, were you concerned with copycats? Or like what are some of the measures taken to protect yourself? <laughs> yeah, so uh, when you're crowdfunding on Kickstarter, there's this article that anyone here can read that shows you how like by the time if you are a really successful campaign, by the time you're actually done on Kickstarter, like 30 days from the time you start, there will be a, a pirated product available on top of for whatever you're trying to do right and this has happened time and time and time again right so uh this happens a lot there 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 are few ways that you can protect yourself for uh for a product like potato pirates when we are sending our master files to a manufacturer um if they want to screw you over it's very easy for them right so like they can easily manufacture you know maybe Five, ten thousand more than they are telling you, or maybe it gets like one, two thousand more, and um, yeah, then it just becomes a parallel market, right? And there's nothing that you can do to protect yourself against that. So on that note, um, potato pirates is uh, copyrighted and trademarked in many different countries of the world. Uh, that's one way we protect ourselves. But at at the end of the day, you want to be able. Um, to, you you need to not rely on these kind of things in order to be protected, right? You want in more intelligent ways to protect yourself. So, what are some intelligent ways you can protect yourself? So, for example, um, if we are coming up with an app for our game, right? So we would need uh, our users to download the the app on their phone in order to have the full experience of the physical game. So even if someone Create a pirated copy of the game. Um, you know they still need to download something from you, so that sort of allows you to have control everything in house, right? That's one way of doing it. Um, I mean, there are many different ways, and I think everyone has to be more creative about the way that they want to, you know, protect themselves. But um, only worthy products get copied. So if you are actually getting copied, it's okay. It just means that you are worthy of being copied. You know, um, I spoke to one of the like, like one of the veteran game designers from Singapore when I was first starting out in 2018 or 2017 at the Game Games Exchange Expo, and I I asked him about this exact question, right? And he just told me like, you know, all those people that they are gonna serve. They were not going to be your market anyway. You were never going to be able to sell to them because you are targeting a very different customer base. And these people, like if they're selling, let's say if someone uh, is selling potato pies in like some part of China, right, suburban China or something, right, um, we would never going to be able to sell to them directly anyway. So it's not exactly part of your market. But of course, this line becomes like becomes more thin when like that copyrighted or pirated product gets, uh, you know, available internationally. So like, even for me, like I own like two fake games, uh, being very honest, I own two fake games. Um, one of the biggest games in the world, uh, which is Catan, Settlers of Catan and uh, Splendor. Uh, I bought these games on on uh, Shopee, I think, and they were like dirt cheap. I was like, how come they're so cheap? Like shit, I felt so bad because like me as a creator, like you know, not supporting other game creators, I felt really bad. But yeah, I mean, it's literally one third or one one quarter of the price. So it is a definite problem. Like if people here play any board games, 
Um, you know, the most commonly uh, copied board games are, uh, or card games are like Exploding Kittens, Catan, Splendor, things like that. Like things that people actually enjoy playing, things that you and I have heard of, those get copied. Things like, I guess, Potato Pirates that not many people heard of, <laughs> those don't get copied so much. So I guess we're still free. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so from Olivia, do you also feel that the ratio of international to local contributors backing you is significantly larger? Like, is it harder to raise funds if your product is directed more towards the local market? Yeah, uh, Olivia, that's a good question again. Um, yes or no, Olivia? Uh, Potato Pirates is definitely a, a global product. Uh, about five, maximum 10% of our market is in Singapore, right? Uh, like I've, as I mentioned earlier, maybe 40 to 50% of our market is in the US. The biggest markets from like in terms of geography for us are US, Canada, UK, Germany, Australia, and New Zealand. And after that comes like places like France, Italy, Spain, right? Things like that. Um, Singapore is not really anywhere near or any of these countries in terms of volume. Um, does it does it impede your progress or your uh, you know your chances of success if it's a strictly local localized product? Yes, but at the same time, no, because look at the Singaporean dream, right? It's a card game, right? And it's super localized, right? Only local people appreciate it. But that's the beauty of it. That's why it's so popular in Singapore. And now it's popular in the region, right? Because it's being sold in the region where, um, you know, people could appreciate that kind of humor, right? So I would say my short answer is yes, you should not try and limit yourself to a certain geography. But at the same time, if it's, you know, if, if the entire essence of the product revolves around it being localized, like the Singapore and Dream, go for it. I think it's a great, you know, it, 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 it's very refreshing to see that. Okay. Yeah, then um, Calvin asks, like, what is your opinion of using companies to produce professional slick marketing videos? Yeah, um, that's good. Definitely good. But a lot more, uh, Calvin, comes with that. Because typically, uh, Kickstarter is an ecosystem, right? Kickstarter um, has not, the campaign is uh, like really just what people see. There's so much that happens behind the scenes. There's like Kickstarter exclusive marketing agencies that you can work with to market your product. We have worked with them. Um, they are Kickstarter, uh, like sort of like all encompassing, you know, from start to end. They will help you. Um, yeah, do your marketing. They will help you come up with a landing page. They will come up with the video and everything. But they will also ask you for an arm and a leg. So they they will want like you know maybe like I don't know I don't know what the terms are, but it, I think it goes up to like thirty percent of your raise, right? They will want that much money that you raise. So let's say you're raising, you know, let's say a million dollars, you're gonna have to give them thirty percent of that or whatever not. So my opinion is for sure, yeah, use that, but only use that if you really don't have any other option. So to me, right, to me, Kickstarter is a place to showcase your creative potential, which is why every single thing that we do on Kickstarter is done also, right? From the video to the landing page, to the artwork, to everything, uh, all of that is done in-house by us. Of course, like maybe we have a few more people, uh, you know, if you're a one-man or two-man show, it may be a bit more difficult, but to me, that is really the fun of Kickstarter because you get to do everything yourself. Really, really explore your creative potential and your creative genius. So um, uh, it's a double-edged uh, double sword because you definitely want to create something slick, uh, you know, in order to win people over. But slick doesn't need to mean high budget or, you know, using After Effects and like, you know, amazing renders or whatever not. Like you can always find easier ways to, you know, do a good product uh, video without having to, uh, without uh, an over the top budget or over the top skill set. So use, um, you know, uh, tools like Filmora. Filmora is a great tool for like people who are not that great with video editing to build video. Use voices.com. Voices.com is a great tool where you can find pretty affordable, excellent voice actors, right? 
to um, voice over your video. And there you go, voila, you have, uh, you know, you have a pretty professional looking video. So, uh, I mean, use, use tools like Fiverr, right? Fiverr, can, you can ask people to do everything under the sun in Fiverr. So, um, I mean, you can outsource certain things, but I don't think you should outsource the entire um, project or the entire responsibility to someone else. So, to me, it sort of like defeats the purpose of trying to run a Pixar mm. campaign. Um, yeah, can, can I list the sites uh, mentioned? You can check out an article that we wrote. If you search how to design, how to design a card game, um, we are probably the first or second search results on Google. And it's a Medium article we wrote, and we list out the entire prototyping process. A lot of what I have shared here can be found on that article. Mm, I see. OK. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so the next question is, how do you decide which is the best country to manufacture your product? And how do you get leads to this manufacturer? Yeah, so uh, I covered a bit of this during the talk. So uh, when we were at the board game convention uh, in, in Germany, we started talking to a lot of manufacturers. Even before that, we had like, you know, spoken to a lot of manufacturers. And I guess we just were, um, I guess, uh, in a way, a bit more biased towards, <laughs> towards working with Chinese manufacturers just because we saw that most of like the other board games that we have, you know, are built on, are, 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 are manufactured in China. And we, I mean, just based on that, we, we sort of like went with that. Okay. And so that was like, that was like pretty much clear like, okay, for board games, you know, Chinese manufacturers are pretty reliable, but that's not, that's not like the only option. Like, uh, you know, you could definitely manufacture with Singapore manufacturers. Um, there are a bunch of games that are manufactured in Singapore. Um, Indonesia also has good, like, you know, in, I'm, I'm just stating the people in this region, right? So it's not that only China can do it, but like we just saw like a lot of the other products that we own were done in China. So we just, we just went with that. How do we get leads to these manufacturers? Great question again. Um, network, right? So we just, we, we started talking to other, other independent green creators, just ask them like, Hey, where did you, you know, manufacture your product? Um, and while, while we were there, uh, in Germany, um, you know, we, so the, 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 the manufacturer we worked with is called What Games. What Games was actually manufactured, uh, so, so, uh, this manufacturer was recommended to us by a guy who just stopped by our booth. And I literally took a screenshot of the managing director, um, the, the managing director's card, his name card from that guy, right? I took a phone phone photo with uh, with that guy's phone and I emailed this guy the next day while I was still in Germany. And um, we went to actually see him and we liked his setup and we trusted him the most. And now this guy is the only manufacturer we use, right? Um, so just keep networking, just keep finding out more and more. Uh, Shopify recently wrote a really good article about where to find, find you know, the best, where to find the manufacturer. And it's a, like a 15 minute long read. So read through that. I think that resource is great as well. Um, yeah, and and be more critical of the products that you are using. So look look at, look at the, look at like, um the products you use every day you know look at the packaging see what it says where it's where it's manufactured blah 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 um you know just be a web sleuth you know try and find your own data on all these things it's, it's not difficult to do certain youtubers do that as well where they are trying to find like popular products you know like um this is called the iron plus so i think there was a certain youtuber who went online and tried to find out what's the manufacturing cost of this and he did find that out very easily you know um he basically looked um at the underside of the bottom packaging and then he checked um where the shipment originated from and uh so he went on the he went on like the u.s customs website and tried to track the man the the origin of this of, of, of you know the the shipment and he traced it back to the manufacturer and you know he was easily able to go to so the manufacturer also had a website and he was easily able to go on the manufacturer's website and, and found, you know, it was just a few dollars to produce and stuff like that. So, yeah, you can always, we're in the world of, you know, we, we live in a world of connectivity and it's, it's, everything is digital. So you can easily 
find the answers to all these questions. You just need to know how to look. Um, and I think there's a question about what are our plans moving forward. So right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create, a, you know, an ecosystem of potato pirates with our third game, which with which we are trying to introduce a lot more replayability. We're trying to introduce a lot more depth into the like, into the game. Uh, at the same time, we are also trying to introduce um, uh, um, introduce like a digital component that allows for assessment because that's part and parcel of what it's used for. So, uh, and also because like we are in the midst of a pandemic where like face-to-face -face interaction in not all countries is always okay. So that that's another reason why we are going online. And I mean, it's kind of funny for a game that prides itself on, on like hating screens and like we are computer science without computers and now we are going online. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny, but like, I guess the, um, the the fine line, the fine print is uh, except in pandemics. <laughs> so uh, that's our, I mean, that's our focus for Potato Pirates, but now we're, in the, we're on the cusp of launching our second product as well, which is Wojak. So of course, um, I guess like one question that may be on people's minds is like, why would you launch a second product uh, instead of trying to just push for the growth of Potato Pirates, which like, sort of is a proven product already? Um, I guess the answer is uh, really because to me, Kodomo as, uh, as as an entity is not fully represented by Potato Pirates, you know. So there's a little bit more to what we do in Kodomo than just what is represented by Potato Pirates. And I think both these products together, Potato Pirates and Rojak, really represent the essence of Kodomo, represent, I guess, myself, you know. Um, and that's, that's what uh, we have always envisioned, I guess, five, six years ago, we just never knew how we would achieve it. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Norman. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty much having a chat with Yeah, so I think uh, <laughs> one last question like, before we end. Uh, so I think just now you actually mentioned about um, the Singaporean dream, right? like it being local. So I guess uh, my question is like, is it still advisable to use Kickstarter or like such crowdfunding platforms if you're only focusing in the like, Singapore market? Yeah, I think Singaporean Dream was uh, mm -hmm. a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, for sure. Um, in fact, Singapore is a big sort of uh, place for crowdfunding, especially on Kickstarter. So um, here's the deal. Two, four, five, uh, four, four years ago, in 2016, until 2016, you could not run a Kickstarter campaign oh. as a Singaporean. Okay, right. Why? Because Kickstarter didn't have a Singapore office. Okay. So um, at that time, Kickstarter only uh, existed in the US. So if you wanted to launch a Kickstarter campaign, you had to beg for or steal some of your friends or someone's uh, social security number and tax code filing um, number so that um, they, they could, this fund that is you know, raised could be sort of connected to some person, right? And that person needs to be a US citizen. All right, so that's how campaigns outside of US used to be run on Kickstarter back in the day, right? Now it's super simple because Kickstarter is present in many different countries, and one of those countries happens to be Singapore. So that's why Singaporean creators are now having a crack at um, you know running Kickstarter campaigns. Um, there's one uh, campaign called the Pirate 3D Pirate 3D Printer. And that was actually launched by a bunch of Singaporeans, but not from Singapore. Those were launched from uh, US. Yeah, so they, they sort of like had a connection in the US and they managed to get, yeah, they managed to get funded from their, through their friend in the US. So yeah, they, they oh, basically stayed okay. on. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for the event and also for answering all the questions in the Q&A. So I think um yeah, if there is you. oh so I think if there's no other questions. Uh <laughs> I think uh thank you so much for joining us at this event today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me.